one of my favorite people. So we got Jack, Jack Daniel. Jack is the, I'm gonna say just fill in the blank here for job title, at Tenable Security. He has over 20 years experience in network and system administration, and I think his epic beard has well over 30. Jack is a technology community activist. Jack is a co-founder of Security B-Sides Movement, and he serves on the board of directors for Security B-Sides Las Vegas and uh, for Security B-Sides Incorporated. Uh, he's also a frequent speaker at technology and security events, large and small, and he has co-hosted Paul's Security Weekly, where I think they discuss security sometimes, but they might do some other things on the show as well. So just like Dave this morning, I also asked Jack Friends for a comment about him. And besides Las Vegas president, Banshee, said, Jack Daniel is a misnomer of a name. While Gentleman Jack certainly fits, this guy is much smoother and more sophisticated than any straight whiskey. He's a bespoke cocktail made of the essence of community, a jigger of irreverence, and a few dashes of humility. I think most of us would probably agree with that about Jack. Jack is a reluctant CISSP, holds the CCSK, <laughs> and is a Microsoft MVP for enterprise security. Jack's Uncommon Sense Security Blog was named to the Security Bloggers Hall of Fame in 2013. And it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Jack Daniel. And now we do combat with technology. Look at that. Note, stupid speaker turns itself off. Uh, da, 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 da. So there's my uh, presentation tip for you. If you ever give presentations, uh, whatever you do wrong or your note, go back into that slide deck, add a hidden slide at the very beginning to remind yourself of stuff like uh, I just did there, which is the stupid speaker I'm gonna use turns itself off. Uh, so let's see, let's turn things on. Let's, let's make some noise. Um, oh yeah, wallpaper. I have no idea why my wife bought that painting for me, uh, Honey Badger clutching a cocktail. Um, <laughs> that's, I have no idea what that symbolizes. Oh, really? Okay. This is where we do mortal combat with technology. Anyone ever feel that their love of technology is unrequited? Uh, here we go. Now this is where it gets tricky because I try to use music and stuff. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story. This is this is where we argue with the technology again. Come on, see, I knew it would do that. See, try to be clever, Jack, and look what happens. All right, let's see, let's see. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Let's try this again. There we go. I'm gonna tell you a story. That's called pandering, by the way. That's your second tip on presentation, pander to the audience. Um, all right, uh, but first, a couple of you might have seen Jeff's comment. I'm going to keep this short. Um, three weeks ago, we lost Becky Bass. Uh, if you did not know Becky, I feel sorry for you. Uh, she was an amazing person. I won't go into depth, but uh, Info Mom, um, I only got to know her in the past few years. She was an amazing person. Uh, she was a mentor to more people than you would believe a single person could be. Um, and could, how many folks in here knew Becky, did, knew Becky well? Okay. Um, Becky, uh, as you know, then ended her career uh, before she passed away at the University of South Alabama. And as all good professors, she left us homework 
The homework is for those of us that were touched by Becky to turn out to those of you that didn't raise your hands and be here to support you because that's what community is about. Um, people have come before us and been amazing and uh, we owe it to them to continue that, which is a good segue into one of my projects, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but I'm gonna mention this. Uh, one of the things that I talk about sometimes, and I've got a project called The Shoulders of Infosec. It's a horrible wiki, uh, but the talks are sometimes entertaining. Uh, historical figures in our industry, the folks that got us where we are and some of their stories. Um, the truth of this industry is no matter how you enter it, whether you're trying to get into the industry or whether you've been in it for decades, uh, you run full tilt trying to keep up and we rarely have a chance to look back and figure out where we came from and how we got there, and uh, that's a look back. And sometimes it's great to remember the folks that came before, honor them, the known and the unknown. Uh, sometimes it's depressing as hell to like look at the Ware Report or the Anderson Report or the Orange Book and realize how far we haven't come. Um, but anyway, that's just a side project. And now, you are here. You probably figured that out. So this is uh, Besides Boston. All right, let's, let's see how many people are from Boston proper here. Which is, like all of the cool things in Boston, actually in Cambridge. <laughs> um, that's, that's pandering to one side of the river. Um, uh, yeah, over here on this side, we have all the cool schools and all the student debt. Ouch. Uh, but here's the key thing. Um, you're also part of all of this. We're here, but we're part of this. These are the security B-sides venues across North America. And the green dots are the places that have one's uh, first time events coming up. Springfield, Missouri, and um, Edmonton, um, and Alberta. That's like out there. Um, <laughs> I mean, Calgary's out there, and then you go beyond out there. Uh, but here's the amazing thing. You're also part of all of this. This is the 322nd Security B-Sides event since a handful of us got together and had a hacker house party con in uh, Las Vegas in July of 2009. And it was a reaction to the over-commercialization of some events and a reaction to some interesting stuff being turned down because it just didn't quite fit, you know? Uh, the very first B-Sides uh, was in Vegas and it was a lot of DEF CON 303 crew, a bunch of others. Um, we had the most attended uh, and most talked about a session there was a panel on gender in gender issues and in information security. 2009, in July, uh, a bunch of us misogynistic hackers uh, actually ha hosted a panel that was amazing. That's uh, for those keeping score. Not that I believe in keeping score against the big guys, but that was over five years before RSA was ready to tackle that. Um, it's content that matters to you that makes B-Sides. It's why these events are so fantastic. Um, B-Sides, in the early days, I quickly realized there were the three C's that I considered the pillars of B-Sides. Content, community, and conversation. Um, share good content, foster conversation, help build local communities. Um, Vegas is a little different because nobody is local in Vegas and the locals don't engage except for a few, but it, it, that was where you know, it really took out. And one of the things that we realized very quickly was there was a fourth C in that pillar, which is career. If you actually share good content, build community, have good conversations, people's careers advance. And that became uh, clear. So those are the, the kind of what I see as the four Cs. Um, if you're trying to count, you don't have to. 106 unique cities have held events. Um, 26 countries, 28 countries, uh, have held events, assuming that we count Scotland as a separate country, which it will be soon enough. Thank you, Brexit. Uh, some of the, the upcoming ones, uh, yes, that's Myanmar, Delhi, India, Uganda, um, uh, Kampala, Uganda, Gibraltar, Bordeaux. They're planning on fall. I don't know, I'm sure none of you would like to go to Bordeaux in the fall. I'm sure that's terrible. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, Amsterdam. Yeah, nobody wants to go to Amsterdam either. 
uh, that's all right, marijuana is legal in Massachusetts now, right? Uh, just try to buy it legally. So, uh, this morning, uh, I was asked, and I'll ask again, um, how many people here, is this your first B-Sides event ever? Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. So, um, a lot of events have, you know, you see people with the badges, with alumni and whatever, and the founder's circle and bullshit like that. Um, this is a growing community, a growing global community. If you're growing an entity, your foundation has to grow with that. Everyone here is part of the Founders Circle. Welcome to the Founders Circle, whether this is your first or 50th B-Sides. You're part of the Founders Circle. You're part of the foundation of this community. We, like to, we talk about participants, not attendees. That means you. Talk to people. Um, actually engage. That's what it's about. Um, before I get into the actual topic, I, I realized I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, we were talking about community building, and I distilled all of the essence of community building down to six words. Now, in Boston, we have so many, I say we even though I've now moved south, um, it's, it's such a great community of communities. The number of meetups that there are, the old Boston Computer Society for folks that have been around, it was always a great region for sharing information. Part of it is because you may have noticed there are some pretty cool institutions of learning here. We're at one that a lot of people think is cool. Uh, they're right. Um, so in six words, some are repeated. Give a darn. Uh, you might want to use a stronger word. Um, but you have to care about the community that you're engaged in. Uh, Wow, people actually care about stuff here. People are, you know, forgive me for using the word passionate, but people are passionate about technology. Okay? Um, people are passionate about sharing their ideas and give people a voice. And that's what B-Sides does and a lot of other things. It's what I like about communities. Give people a voice. Of course, if we're talking in the corporate world, a lot of you have seen companies that have like community teams. And they don't give, well, they just want you to give them money. No, if you give your customers a voice and then listen, that builds corporate community too, which some companies get. But uh, that's not really my world. Um, but I'm going to change gears and get into what I want to talk about. This talk uh, shifted topics several times, and I'm going to do something I don't like to do. I'm going to repeat chunks of talks. Some of you may have seen a few of these slides, but it's a message that hasn't gotten through to enough people. Um, so now for something completely different. Head here. What the heck is that? Keep watching this. It's That's a young Korean woman named Luna Lee. I thought we would put that in there for a little break to tell you we're changing direction. Uh, she, um, <laughs> that's not where you expected that to go when you heard the, uh, the beginning of the guitar solo. Uh, that's a, a traditional Korean instrument called a gagayim, and she does a ton of classic rock covers and blues covers on the gagayim. Uh, she started to do vocals. She has an elfin Korean voice that's uh, it's just crazy. But anyway, um, that, that was just to show you we were changing direction, and I think that worked. Um, she Shredding on the gagayim is not normal rock lexicon, but there we go. So um, <laughs> this section is called uh, Put on Your Own Mask Before Helping Others. Um, we're in New England. <laughs> I've spent... 40 years here. I moved here temporarily. I moved to Cape Cod temporarily in 1977. Um, and uh, it's interesting because we're tough. We're stoic, right? Which is an interesting word because the word stoic means one thing and the practice of stoicism means something very different. 
but we're tough. We can do stuff. Our technology, we're going to work ourselves to do. You think those people in Silicon Valley work hard. No, they work long hours. They're just not very good, so they have to work really long hours. We're good, and therefore we get a lot done, and we work even longer hours because we're hardworking New Englanders, damn it. It's a good thing we don't burn ourselves out. It's a good thing we don't suffer from stress. It's a good thing we don't take that stress home. Um, so I hope no one gets value from this presentation. <laughs> because if you don't get any value from this, you aren't stressed. Nobody in your life is stressed. Nobody's suffering the things that life throws at us. Um, you're not paying attention to cable news. You're not, yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, uh, also, this laptop and this version of PowerPoint have become sentient and they heckle me in my own presentations. <laughs> So aim high. Uh, why this topic? I love my job. I have an amazing job. I hardly have a job at all. Um, I have a job with a company that you know, and I'm not, it may have been on a slide earlier, but um, I, most of my job is engaging with communities, whether or not it has anything to do with the company. It's because we actually value this community. Um, so I work at Tenable Network Security. You know what's really cool? Uh, if it weren't for those of us in this space where our sales teams compete uh, daily, um, Rapid7 and Qualys and Tenable and uh, Tripwire, um, our space sponsors more of these events, bigger and smaller events, puts people out that speak. How many Rapid7 speakers are here? I mean, they're across the river. Um, it's, so it's really cool, and I, I think it's awesome that I'm part of this. I have an amazing job. Um, but, you know, the reality is not everybody's job is great. Hello, this is Danny, in-house psychologist for Norton Corp. Danny, I'm sick of typing. I want to quit, but I don't know how I'd support myself if I did. Well, ask yourself this question. What is it that you really enjoy about typing? Are you still there? I don't like anything about typing. Every morning when I get ready for work, I start crying. What's wrong with me? You hate your work. It's normal. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it turns out not everybody uh, has a great job. Um, <laughs> turns out life is more than work, or at least it ought to be. Um, so we should just kind of be prepared for ourselves, uh, friends, family, peers, community. Um, several years ago, Dan Gear said this, and I have to thank Gal Sponsor for grabbing this quote and throwing it to me. Security is too wide to master, too deep to know, and too fast to photograph. And Dan said this several years ago. I don't know if you've noticed, it hasn't gotten easier, it hasn't gotten narrower, it hasn't gotten shallower, and it certainly hasn't slowed down. So, um, so a couple of months ago, uh, Joey, uh, who does DFIR, posted this on Twitter and um, asked this question, and here were the results. Um, do you work in DFIR? Have you had a case that bothered you after? Um, so, as you can see, 22% lied. Um, <laughs> uh, and 40% I drink a lot. No kidding, really? That's it. Um, the threat landscape, summarized in the immortal words of Bob Dylan. Everybody must get on. <laughs> Yes, I have fun with audio clips, if you don't know them, so. So where does that leave us? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're trying to do a good job. We're trying to share, we're trying to move forward, but we have some challenges. Um, you know, it's, what's going, uh, you know, thankfully, none of us are trying to defend networks with, say, Windows systems on them this weekend, right? <laughs> it's not like it's a holiday weekend with a B-sides when, uh, <laughs> And then the bad days look more like that. <laughs> All right, maybe that was a bit harsh, so we can give you the feline face palm if that's better for you. Uh, so how do we cope? You know, um, and not just cope. We want to survive and thrive. We want to be productive. Arguably, we even want to be happy. Um, so what we're trying to do is not end up listening to this um, sound, 
lying there in the bed in that sexy Johnny that they put you in when they hook the machines up to you. Um, we're hoping to actually be productive and healthy. Um, so, disclaimer, pay no attention to me. Just because I am dressed like a madman and have a giant eunuch's beard does not mean that I know anything. Um, but I do have the microphone and the clicker, um, <laughs> which makes me an expert. Uh, I'm an amateur guy at the best. I get my, lost myself. Um, Here's one I know something about. So one of the things that uh, I've discovered about stress is it will destroy your memory. Um, recreational marijuana, I can't lose any more short-term memory. Um, it's like, I, I, I want to do it, but I keep forgetting to smoke. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's real. The first time we had uh, uh, an interesting family crisis many years ago, my doctor, um, who I saw a couple of days ago. He's been my primary care physician since I was a teenager. Yes, he is old. Um, it's like, hey, so you're gonna notice some things going through the stuff you're going through, including memory loss, and it'll get better. And every big stress cycle in my life, since then, it gets worse. I bounce back less and less. I tend to walk around with notepads, have five or six note-taking apps on my phones, things like that. Um, but it's true, so the stress. Now, the good thing is, if you work in, forgive me, cybersecurity, the good thing is we really don't have to remember anything. Uh, so stress uh, really is, it's real. Um, there's any kind of stress, chemical or physical. So putting your body under uh, stress, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. But so uh, when people, here's one, just uh, chemo brain. When people talk about chemo brain, uh, they're just starting to believe that's a real thing. Of course, anybody that's ever been through chemotherapy will tell you, of course, it's a real thing. Um, so anything that stresses your body, whether it's work-related, family-related, or whether it has a negative impact on memory. And I've got to talk about this one because I have no idea why they invited me to keynote. It's like there are people that actually do shit that are here today. Why don't you have them up here? Um, I am an intermittently entertaining old guy. I don't understand why anyone has any respect for me. And I'm not kidding when I say that. Um, I guess I've done some stuff, you know, but everybody here has done stuff. I'm in a room full of brilliant people at here, right? I, why? I don't know. Um, a lot of us do this, and I think a, um, a little bit of humility is a great thing. You know, don't be too full of yourself. Um, we, have, we have enough of those in this industry. Um, but it can also be debilitating if you don't believe you deserve the opportunity you get. You know, the reality is a lot of times in this industry, you don't deserve the opportunity you get, but you get the opportunity and there are two different ways to look at it. Well, ideally I would have earned this first, but damn it, I'm going to earn it now. That's the correct one. The other one is the flip. Those are those people who think they know what they're talking about, but really don't. These are actually opposite ends of a spectrum. Uh, the people who think they're brilliant. Um, it's interesting in uh, a hacker community in particular, most people who, um, uh, you know, have uh, imposter syndrome, you know, they, they should flip. There are a lot of people that really need to doubt themselves that don't. I'll just leave it at that. So we're talking about stress, and we're not going to get into the, the burnout stuff. I'll touch on it briefly. But when you talk about uh, clinical stress, clinical burnout, there are three key words, three measures. Christina Maslach did the, the seminal work on this. Um, there's one good word, two bad words. The good word is efficacy, personal efficacy. Are you effective? Do you feel you're effective? Do you feel like you're doing a good job? That doesn't mean are we beating the bad guys every day, but it, it's, do you feel like you're contributing? Are you doing well? Um, the two bad words are exhaustion, and this is, you know, we gotta decide, good exhaustion, right? If you're, if you're one of those crazy people that cares about health and stuff and like runs and crap, um, that good tired you get, um, or, you know, you've finished a project and you feel good about it, you're tired, but you feel good. Now, this is the debilitating, crushed, uh, exhaustion. And then the uh, third one is cynicism. And in some studies we've done, that is the core competency of uh, information security and hacker world. <laughs> and I, I say that cynicism is, and it's interesting because there's this line you cross. You can't be good at this, I don't believe, unless you're skeptical. 
Don't take stuff at face value. Crossing the line into cynicism starts to get dangerous. Um, in other fields, in medical fields or in social work, that instead of being cynicism is depersonalization, when you no longer care about the people that you're responsible for in these things. Uh, but ours is cynicism and boy are we good at it. Now one very important thing is this George Carlin quote which hurts me every time I put uh, it up or somebody actually it gets thrown back at me more often than I share it these days. Inside every cynical person is a disappointed idealist. And that is also true in our community and so that disappointment's a little rough. So some years ago a bunch of us did a study on burnout. Um, we went through the numbers and what we saw um, it was um, since I'm in an actual institution, I will, you know, give the disclaimer. It was um, statistically insignificant, but potentially informative. It's kind of the way I feel about most of what I have to say, too. But um. <laughs> So when I started looking at this, how you avoid being in the other talk where people show us the scars from their suicide attempts and things, the preventative, let's look at the half that had no warning indicators was better random noise generation than what the NSA convinced RSA to put in their product. Um, <laughs> oh, that's mean. <laughs> Last time I made that joke, I looked up and realized that the core sponsor of the event was RSA. <laughs> uh, so, so moving on, who wants some coffee? You all have had lunch. Um, so we want some coffee. Tell me if this starts to sound painfully familiar. So we have uh, happy little coffee beans in the mountains, right? Happy little coffee beans. And some guy comes and tears them off of the plant and throws them in a bucket. <laughs> and jams them into a bucket, cubicle, whatever. Um, <laughs> ships them somewhere where they get roasted and then ground up and put in a machine where they add boiling hot water, sometimes at extreme high pressure. <laughs> Cubicle, what? Um, <laughs> and then what gets spit out, um, maybe a wonderful magical elixir, um, or it might be burnt and bitter and miserable and vindictive, and, uh, or maybe not vindictive, I'm not sure if it, vindictive cough. Well, yeah, I take that back. <laughs> So, um, you know, maybe you're not into straight espresso shots, but maybe, you know, you want an Americano or a latte. So you take, you take this process and you do this magical, bitter, complex elixir, and maybe you add sweetener, maybe you add creamer, maybe you add water, and you make it good. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do this stress burnout stack, but keep things on the top, above the filter, so we have a nice, clean, um, Clean, crisp coffee that's not burnt and uh, not fried. And so, yeah, we won't go through that. That's too many words. Um, so I did the scientific thing uh, several months ago. <laughs> and I got, I mean, seriously, I got uh, like s over 600 individual respondents, over 700 responses. Uh, not just on Twitter. I got phone calls and texts and emails and things. Um, one of the better answers was this. So a couple of things that came out of that is um, I discovered there are large stresses and there are small stresses and some in between. But what I, what I saw was a split. There are a lot of people that have coping skills to put up with daily bullshit and a lot of people that can deal with big bullshit, but sometimes they mix them up. And um, so you have to understand the context you're working in. Um, if you have really good daily coping skills in a hopeless situation, you are continuously trying to cope with something hopeless and you're miserable. Um, if you don't have those day-to-day -day coping skills, then you may end up job hopping because you can't solve little problems and you let it boil up until you can't stand it anymore. Uh, so what I'm saying is context is uh, important. So some of you may know I am a native Texan, born and raised in Texas. Um, and every few years, they decide that they're going to secede. 
And so here, you know, I get back to Texas with some regularity. Um, I was just in, in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. Um, and here we have your typical redneck pickup truck, and it sends a very clear message, right? Um, we understand what this redneck with a cherry picker in the bed of his truck is telling us with his pro-secession bumper sticker, or do you? Because it turns out if there's a Massachusetts plate on that pickup truck, <laughs> the message is, and stay out. <laughs> Context matters. <laughs> Actually, what this means is I love to screw with my neighbors. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, whatever. So what I'm saying is sometimes your situation is bad and you need to take a big step. This is not the place to take a big step. Uh, so, anecdata, common answers from Twitter, it must be right. Uh, so how do you deal? Huh, badly, not well, not well, cry, rant. Um, so, but there were a lot of good answers. So there's one huge category, the number two answer, I lumped together as do something. Physical activity, this is how most people cope. Uh, when I used to do support, I would get up, walk 200 yards out of the building, down the street, go to Starbucks, get a vat of caffeine, walk back down and sit back down in my cubicle and resume support calls, because being caffeinated all day is really good for stress. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, it kept me from reaching through the telephone, you know, it kept me from implementing dope slap over IP. Um, <laughs> which I know some of you would like me to have invented. Um, um, another one that was, you know, so this is some extreme, you know, tough mutter, mud run, whatever, or get up and walk to Starbucks, or walk around the building, or, you know, camp, or whatever. You just do something physical. A lot of folks do extreme stuff, extreme weightlifting, whatever you're doing. Some people go camping. Get outside. Just do something physical. Um, music was a huge one. So whether you're into... Uh, 70s mush rock, uh, or like me, and just some older pre punk sonic stuff. Uh, that's the Sonics from 1965, by the way. That's uh, punk many years before punk. That's grunge decades before grunge. Sonics are. Uh, amazing, but whatever the music is, some people create music, some people play in bands. Uh, people often assume I have some, you know, ZZ Top or something. Um, I prefer the comparison to Darwin, male pattern baldness, overweight, uh, long beard. But um, I, I've yet to master the MP3 player, so I, I don't play music. But I listen to a lot of music, and it's whatever does it for you. Um, I wouldn't have discovered Luna Lee shredding on the Gagayam. Um, she has a ton of stuff on YouTube. It's amazing. Um, you know, whatever does it for you. But music really can be uh, good for you and, uh, you know, change it up. And, uh, you know, maybe the death metal stuff isn't ideal um, for calming you down. But whatever does it for you, you know. Um, which leads into the next topic. Uh, so let's talk about alcohol, the number one answer. Um, and look, I drink too much. Um, I like to, I'm an amateur bartender and professional drunk. Um, what's funny, what's funny is I have made friends with a lot of really talented professional bartenders. When I use that line, they describe themselves the same way. Um, I don't drink near as much as I appear to on Twitter. Nobody drinks as much as I appear to on Twitter, just for the record. Um, I all right, so on the upside, I will say most of us feel guilty for how much we drink. Um, but that is, that was by far the number one coping skill that we've got. That's uh, less than ideal. Um, you know, at least I try to drink well, if not uh, less. Yeah, <laughs> later, Jeff, thank you. Um, <laughs> Which leads into this one. Um, so, let's see. So, legal drugs are a challenge. So, if they're prescribed, some of them are deadly. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but if people prescribe drugs for you, um, 
you need to take responsibility for your own health care and uh, do some reality checks on things. Um, I'm not saying don't listen to therapists and clinicians if you need that help, get it. Um, their good ones are good. Just be aware that there are side effects. Uh, and then we get into the legal recreational drugs. So marijuana is legal recreationally in a lot of places and medically in a lot, even more places in the US. But it's still federally illegal and it makes trouble for people who are not US citizens coming back into the US if you admit that you legally smoked marijuana in Denver when it was legal or Amster, you know, it's like, oh, that's illegal and you can't come back. So people are having trouble. So this is a challenge, but um, you know, marijuana's effects, uh, we don't have a lot of scientific effect, evidence. It's a lot of anecdotal evidence, whatever. Uh, you can look at me and see my age. Yes, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I am not going to be judgmental about your recreational use of pharmaceuticals. Um, to paraphrase um, um, uh, Ambassador Duke, uh, just don't be dumb about it. Um, in this, I, I've got to like cross the line into preachiness here a little bit. Uh, so there's a lot of folks that are into biohacking. Um, if you're abusing drugs that have killed generations of people before you, uh, you're not biohacking, you're abusing drugs and you're going to be the next generation of people that die doing stupid shit. And I'm not going to say anything bad about a couple of people in our community that we have lost because there were great people and they did dumb shit. But if Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and generations before and after John Belushi couldn't do it, you can't either. Uh, don't be stupid. Have fun. Don't be stupid. Um, that's a little too preachy. Friends and family. Um, support, especially mutual support, uh, is awesome, but sometimes it's one-sided. One of the interesting things that I've seen as people mature in this industry, um, a lot of folks end up in this situation where they may have pretty good jobs. They've moved through careers, have a pretty good job, have kids in school, kids going to college, trying to figure out how to pay for that, parents going into assisted living facilities, so they're caring for the generation before and after at the same time. You can have a job as awesome and, as mine and be in that situation and realize you need to manage your own stress and your own relationships. Um, you know, I am not in that situation, but uh, you know, a lot of my peers are. You know, th there's stuff outside. Uh, you need to think about taking care of yourself because you can't take care of them. Um, and if it's mutual, it's great, but you know. So here's one, disconnect, unplug. This is one of the top five. Disconnect and unplug, and this is really uh, important. Um, if you are more trusting, I would suggest that you close your eyes and tilt your head back and join me on a couple of little adventures. It's like a, uh, a train ride through the Scottish Highlands. The hills rolling by, rocks, lumberjacks on the hills. These guys are crazy. Uh, miles and miles of wild rhododendron in bloom. That was amazing. Maybe uh, just join me down in Georgia, walking on the beach. Now, a couple of you are probably thinking, hey, dumbass. Uh, aren't you saying to disconnect and unplug? Why were you recording that? Why were you holding your phone out the window of that train when you should have been having a good time with your wife? Uh, you got me. Also, there's this challenge of unplugging when you come back. We've all done this, right? It's like, oh my God, no. Um, oh, the beauty is now we don't have to go through that. We can put on our smartwatch and it can haunt us every day, every minute. Uh, <laughs> Here's the thing, there's a latch on this, it comes off. Um, the other thing that's really cool about this, there's a do not disturb button right on your wrist. Uh, you can like flip the timer to give me 30 minutes of peace and quiet, set it to do not disturb. Um, so anyway, disconnect, unplug. There are actually companies that are doing this, uh, but a few hours at a time, every bit you get disconnected. Um, some more answers, these came in in various things. Mindfulness and meditation, a lot of people found help in that. Professional therapy. Um, our world still has a problem saying we need to go to therapists for our social and mental situation. We need to get over that. Um, 
various productivity tools. If you're completely disorganized and it causes you trouble, things like getting things done or whatever works for you, do it, right? Um, um, pets, a lot of people find a lot of joy in their pets. Uh, hobbies, video games is interesting. Um, my son works in support, works from his house, gets up in the morning, turns on the computer, hits the bathroom, works for 30 minutes, goes down, makes a pot of tea, comes back up, works for a while, uh, lunchtime, grabs lunch, uh, goes back upstairs, sits in front of the computer. After work, he goes downstairs, makes dinner, watches TV for 20 or 30 minutes while he eats dinner, goes back up into his office, and instead of facing this way to his work computer, he faces this way into the gaming console and spends the rest of the night there. Um, and it, it works for him, but you're still sitting in front of computers, you know, outdoors. Uh, he, he goes outdoors once every week or two to get groceries. Um, and, it, and it works for him. Um, but, you know, I'm making fun of him, but it, it works well for him. But if, if it's not working well for you, don't do it. Um, I got some edge cases. I think maybe some of these folks are screwing with me. Um, <laughs> um, I, I will say the covering yourself in peanut butter one came from an Australian friend of mine, so that may actually be true. <laughs> uh, okay, and I'm about to be mean to you, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it. So sometimes life just figures a way to tell you it's time to readjust your perspective on life. It's time to take a look at what's important and what's not. A couple of you know what's coming. Sorry, I'm going to be mean. This is me in 1976. That's my uh, girlfriend, um, later wife. Uh, we met when she was 14 and I was 15. This is us sitting on the porch of our winter retreat last year. Yes, those are her cremated remains. Do not let life kick you this hard before you figure out what matters and what doesn't. Do not do it. Let's move beyond that one. Um, but let me tell you a few things. Uh, my mother passed away when I was 31, breast cancer. Ah, no big surprise. 31's a bit early to lose your parents, but eh. It happens, she'd been fighting cancer all of her life. <sighs> My own cancer, bladder cancer, eh. ah, it's non-malignant. You just have to have a really awkward exam on a regular basis for the rest of your life. <clears throat> if any of you uh, know what that means. So I'll uh, I did share something else. Oversharing, because I want your attention. Yesterday was colonoscopy day for me. The important thing about that is people tell me I'm full of crap. Today I can bring you a doctor's note proving I'm not. <laughs> at, at least for today. <laughs> so, um, so I'm serious, yeah. Oh, cancer. Oh, well, the tumors are non-malignant, non-metastasizing. So what if I spent a couple of years back to back uh, having bladder resections right before going to DEF CON and B-Sides Vegas? Ah, eh, whatever, you know, that's not, that's, that's dude in his 50s with, oh, it's, it's little cancer, right? It's minor cancer, right? <sighs> so yeah, it was easy for me because I've had awesome jobs for the past decade. But anyway, common sense, don't face challenges alone. In the school play yard, do you get to go off? So no, just Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, let you know. In the military, do you go on? No. But we are all special effing snowflakes, and we're going to do this job alone, even if we're in a team of 50 people. And that's not healthy. healthy. And don't make employees face challenges alone. Um, I've got some counterintuitive advice for you. Um, do more. Because doing things that you want to do that are satisfying and rewarding, volunteering, mentoring, speaking, teaching. Teaching is awesome, whether it's informal, formal, whatever, because you have to learn what you're talking about because people are going to put you on the spot and challenge it, and it makes you learn things. Sharing, being engaged in community. It's why I do what I do because I get a lot of value from what I give to the community. Mentorship is fantastic. Um, if you don't think you are a hypocrite, you need to mentor somebody. 
because you will tell them things like, oh, I've been in that situation, and the one thing you can't do is this. Then you hang up the phone, and then you pick up the bottle and drink because you've done it twice in your career, and you're in the midst of doing it for the third time. <laughs> As you're telling people, don't do that. That's a terrible mistake. That's career limiting, and it's mis you'll be miserable, and you know it because you've done it. Um, learn something new. Education is work, uh, so it's got to be satisfying or give you an opportunity to get out of the hellhole you're in, to be blunt. Um, I'm going to zip through some things, but this is worth noting. Uh, in the hacker community, we've got this challenge. You know. Oh, he's the iPhone hacker. No, he's an actual human being who has done some amazing iPhone work, but when his career changes and he no longer hacks, or she no longer hacks SCADA systems, and he no longer hacks iPhones, they remain actual people. You are actual people. You may be famous for something. A lot of people think of me as the B-Sides guy. Or the beardy guy, but I, there's there's actually somebody under all the layers of crap. Um, you're a person. You know stuff. You hack. Manager, employer. These things apply. If you want to talk about this as a manager, or employer, we can we can do that offline. But uh, two questions: Do you have too many qualified and trained employees, and is it e easy hiring the people you need? <laughs> um, oh, too many words. <laughs> let's let's skip through. So basically, if you don't have any control over your environment, you get stressed. Um, if you don't understand why things are happening, you get stressed. If you're at a company and you're a manager and you're going through an IPO and you have all of these bright young faces that are relatively fresh out of school and they've never been through an IPO, you need to sit them down and say, we're going to do some really dumb shit because we want to make Wall Street happy, not, in, not sentient human beings. Um, that was, uh, that was a little blunt, Jack. Um, so, uh, collective, this is my first real tangent. Collective nouns, right? So, a uh, bunch of cattle is a herd, you know, a bunch of sheep is a flock. My favorite one is uh, a gathering of crows is a murder. Uh, do you know what you call the, um, a feral gathering of vice presidents? An IPO. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are going to laugh until you weep on that one. Um, <laughs> provide feedback. Uh, manage workloads. Let people disconnect. Maybe force it. VW actually forces people to disconnect in Germany. Um, you, they turn off access to email overnight for some employees. Offer education. Uh, it's worth reciting the old joke of, you know, to executives talking about training budget. But what if we train them and they leave? What if we don't train them and they stay? I travel a lot, I get to have fun traveling because I have an awesome job. Some of you are road warriors. Road warrior gets tiring, even if you have an awesome job. But you can make it suck less. Um, the trick is you've got to venture out. Uh, the problem with venturing out is that you don't always know whether it's safe or not. Now, sometimes <laughs> you will find yourself in a neighborhood where the crows are carrying knives and have ankle bracelets on. <laughs> It's like, oh shit, I think, I think I will have that terrible burger at the Courtyard Cafe rather than venture out. But if you do venture out, you know, my tip is, and again, this life's not fair to women, but single women wandering into bars alone is not always a great idea, but, you know, one of my things is I make friends with bartenders everywhere I go because bartenders tend to be well-connected and underpaid, and they will give you some great tips for where to get good food and drink at a reasonable price and how to avoid tourists or also what the most touristy things are if you do. Um, nobody hydrates enough their whole books on how to travel well, but drink more water. Everything you do is dehydrating. When you fly, uh, my doctor swears by always taking antihistamines before you fly, even if you're not snuffly. That way you're not likely to get snuffly. You're not going to have any, uh, you know, less likely to pick up something. If you're here in the Northeast, if you have dry heat, a little saline, you don't have to neti pot, but a little saline, uh, keep your nostrils, nasal passages, Moisturized, they won't dry out and crack when you get in the airplane, you're less likely to pick up um, funk from airplanes. Uh, quickly, uh, helping others. Um, 
You're not a professional, but you can be a friend, you can be a peer, you can be a mentor. You can help people through, uh, do it for yourself, do it for them, do it for whatever reason. When I was young, I wanted everybody to do things for the right reason. Now, it, it, you can be an egotistical bastard, and if that's why you do good for the world, I'm okay with it. I'd still prefer you were a good person, but that's all right, whatever. But back to that original slide, if you're not in a good place, you can't help others, and don't try to. And if you're in a bad place, and this is getting off top, way off topic, even for me, uh, you know, like some of you may have discovered this. You get into relationships trying to fix people. Well, that's because you're broken too, and neither of you is going to come out all right. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm uh, getting close. I got to wrap it up. But I'm going to go off on a tangent now, so I'm going to. Um, yeah, yeah, back up. No. There we go. So, uh, so I'm single for the first time in my life uh, since I was 15, right? So I'm trying to re-enter the dating game and it's really kind of rough. Um, and I try to use pickup lines that are like age appropriate and honest and I'm having no luck. Um, and it just doesn't work. It's like, wow, I bet you used to be hot. <laughs> That's, didn't work, didn't work at all. Um, is, is your name Samsonite? You look like you've got a lot of baggage. No, no. Would you like to be my future widow? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I've had even less success with, do you have a daughter? <laughs> is that wrong? All right, I'm going to waste more time. So, you know, one of the things I've realized is talking to people who are dating in their 40s and 50s and 60s, is like everybody has a psychotic ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. And I don't, right? Because I was in a wonderful relationship for 40 plus years, which means I have a psychotic future girlfriend. So, <laughs> I'm sitting in the bar, it's like, you could be the one. Um, <laughs> I will not feel so all alone. So again, back to the wisdom of Bob Dylan. Uh, sometimes just listening to people is all it takes. When we did the, stress, the, the hardcore burnout stuff, a lot of people just needed to vent, and um, you know, you steer them. So I'm gonna close up with a story about knowing what's important to you. So one of the things that's obvious is if you're a guitarist, your guitar is important to you. In the winter of 1949, B.B. King, this is a Gibson Lucille, um, variant you can buy from Gibson. Um, he was playing, King was playing at a dance hall in Twist, Arkansas. Uh, old, you know, plywood wood shack thrown together. The heating system that they used was 55 gallon metal drum with the top cut off, half filled with kerosene, light the kerosene, fire comes up, everybody dances around it, the band's on one side. Two guys start fighting, they knock it over. So we have a bare wood building with a bare wood floor which now has 25 or 30 gallons of burning kerosene that's poured across the wood. The technical term for this is bad. <laughs> the entire hall goes up in flames. They evacuate. B.B. King gets out with the band to the car, realizes he left his brand new $35 guitar inside the hall. So he ran back in and got it. Got it out. They got in the car and drove away. Getting ready for the next night's show, they heard uh, what had happened. It was two guys fighting over a woman, and the woman's name was Lucille. And a couple of people, others, had died in the fire. Others were injured. Um, and he named that guitar Lucille to remind himself to never do anything that stupid again in the rest of his life. So when you go to hard rock cafes and other things, you will find guitars that look a lot like this that have his signature on them, and every one of them is a real Lucille. But he didn't need a guitar. I mean, he needed a guitar. He didn't need that one guitar. Now, granted, being one of the best guitar players in human history, you can pick up pretty much anything and do it. But he committed himself to, I need a guitar. I want this style. I want an ES-355. For the guitar nerds, 355 is the stereo version of the 335. He's one of the few big commercial artists that uh, had commercial success with a stereo guitar. But that's why some of his stuff, when you listen to it, is the way it is. He's playing a stereo electric guitar. But anyway, you know, B.B. King, 
You know, you see some people like Dick Dale play the same axe for 50 years. Oh, well, it makes sense, because that's a hand-built thing. Leo Fender built Dick Dale's guitar for him. But B.B. Uh, King didn't need a specific guitar. He knew what was important. Not being dead in a fire was important. Again, hopefully, uh, it doesn't take any of the um, abuses that I've just given you. Uh, so sources, no, these are sources of stress. Let's talk about a few sources. Um, if you're interested in this, ping me. I'll share some stuff with you. Um, American Psychological Association, it's sort of pop psychology, but every year they do a study on stress in America. New topic or theme every year, some good information in there. Christina Maslach did the seminal work on this with uh, Michael Leiter. Um, Robert Sapolsky has done a lot of interesting stuff. Some of his stuff gets a little crunchy granola for me, but that's all right. Um, and then um, a handful of podcasts, recent Southern Fried Security and Rally Security podcasts have touched on, on stress and burnout. And that is not the end. That's the end of my talk. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but if you want to catch me, I'll be around this evening, this afternoon. Um, I'm easy to find on that internet thing, but there's a lot more good content. And after the day is over, you continue with the conversations and connections that you've made here today and have a great time and enjoy the rest of B-Sides. Oh, oh, unofficial endorsement. There's this book. I don't agree with it. The whole point of the subtle art of not giving a is he teaches you to not give any and then choose very wisely where you spend them. So they, it's a spoiler alert. It's not about not giving any. It's about giving them only when they matter. So we also have a little gift for Jack. Oh, He's an hey. amateur bartender, he said. So we actually got Gentleman Jack with the Boston B-Sides logo Awesome. On it. Thank you very much. Thank you.